1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now I want to focus your attention this morning on one verse there in 1 Peter chapter 3, and that is verse 7. So 1 Peter chapter 3, let's look together at verse 7. I'll read it for you from the English Standard Version. If you have a different translation, it should be very similar. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Hear the word of the Lord. Peter writes, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, we acknowledge this morning that your word is infallible, inerrant, trustworthy, and sufficient. And so Lord, I pray that you would use your word to educate your people, to instruct us in the ways of righteousness, that you would apply this passage of your infallible word to our lives, especially, Lord, those of us who are husbands here today, but also for those who are wives and those whose marital life is in the past and those whose marital life is yet in the future. And everybody in between, Lord, I pray that you would speak to your church today and glorify yourself, sanctify us by your truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. What has been said, and I've heard it said quite often, that a good marriage is a 50-50 relationship. It has to be 50-50. The husband needs to put in 50%, and the wife needs to put in 50% for everything to be balanced and taken care of. The only problem with that statement is it's not how the Bible talks. It's not a 50-50 proposition. It's not a 50-50 relationship. It's 100%, 100%. You see, your marriage is not going to work if you only put in 50% and expect the other half to put in the other 50%. It's a 100%, 100% proposition. And here in our text this morning, the Apostle Peter turns his attention away from wives to husbands. If you've been here for the last couple of weeks, we spent a couple of weeks looking at verse 1 through 6 and what the Apostle Peter has to say to wives. And today, he spends some time with husbands. And so I want to look at this together. Now before we do, I do want to give one small quick caveat. I won't take as much time as I did with this point as I did a couple of weeks ago. But let me just remind you, even if you are not a husband, this is the Word of God. And the Bible says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so for those of you who are husbands, this text is specifically for you. For those of you who are wives, you'll see that this text also, I pray, will be very beneficial for you. And as I said in my opening prayer, for those of you whose marriage, marital life is already behind you, this passage, if you're part of the body of Christ, is also for you and very helpful as we work together as the family of God and build each other up, and hold each other accountable, this passage, I pray, will be beneficial for you as well. And for those kids, young people, who look forward to a marriage relationship in your future, I pray that this passage will be helpful for you as well. 
And so let's dive into it. And as we did mention, as I just mentioned, we do only have one verse here for husbands, and we had six verses for wives. And so some of y'all might be saying, hey, wait, no fair. Uh, how, how come the wife gets six verses and the husband only gets one? Uh, how, do, how does he get off the hook uh, so easily? Uh, well, before you, uh, you go to that conclusion, let me see if I can make sure that I under, we understand the big picture context of what Peter is doing here in the in this epistle. We've been working our way through, verse by verse, through 1 Peter now for a good while. I think this is, if I remember right, I think this is number 27, 27th or 28th sermon as we work through verse by verse through 1 Peter. And remember the big picture that Peter is dealing with is he's talking to a congregation. He's talking to a church who are going through some very difficult situations in life. They're getting pushed back, and there's problems from without. There's problems from within. And it's very applicable to us today, even though we are 2,000 years removed from the initial people that Peter is writing to. It is found in the Holy Word of God, so it is for us today. And very applicable in so many different ways. And that is why I believe God led me to work our way through First Peter together. As we're living as Christians in very difficult days. And part of the application that Peter is making, especially in this section of, of, the, of the letter, the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3, he's talking specifically of those who are under the authority of someone else and find themselves in very difficult situations. And so, for example, he talks to Christian citizens who are living under the authority of a godless government. And he helps them to think through their responsibilities and how we are to relate to the civil magistrates in that situation. And then he talks to slaves, Christian slaves, who are under the authority of cruel masters and gives them some instruction, some help, and some encouragement on how they are to live under that kind of situation. And then he turns his attention to Christian wives who are under the authority of unbelieving husbands and gives them some words of encouragement, some instructions to live by. And with each one of those, as Christian citizens under a godless government, as Christian slaves under cruel masters, as uh, Christian wives under the authority of unbelieving husbands. They have implications for all the rest of us as well. And so we've seen those things. And so that's why Paul, I think, I mean, Peter spent so much time speaking to wives. So you understand the context there. But then he gives a word to the husbands. And I think there's a couple of reasons why he gives this word to the husbands here in this context. It's almost like he says, hey, before we go any further with this, I need to make sure the husbands don't get the wrong idea of me focusing so much attention on the wives. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One reason is probably because, let's just keep it real, he probably has a group of men they're sitting there hearing him preach to the wives and say, Wives, submit to your husbands. And these guys are tempted to go home and say, Yeah, you got that right. And kick their feet, shoes off and lay back on the couch and say, Hey, woman, you heard what the preacher said. Go get me a beer. You know? And so he's like, Oh, hold on. Slow down, cowboy. Uh, hold your horses. Uh, that ain't how it works here. There's, you have some responsibility here as well. Now, of course, he was talking primarily to wives with unbelieving husbands. But as I pointed out, in those 12 characteristics of a godly Christian wife, they apply to all wives, whether they are husbands or believers or not. And so here he turns his attention to the husbands. And he says, likewise, there's another reason, hopefully I'll remember to pick that up uh, later and try to pull it all together. But let's go ahead and dive into the text. He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now notice that word likewise there. It's an interesting word. If you were here uh, last week, you know that I spent a good bit of time, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, spent a good bit of time just with that word likewise. 
Uh, some translations, some of your translations might uh, read, in the same way. It's the same word that we find up in verse 1 where he says, likewise, or in the same way, wives submit to your husbands. Remember, I pushed back a little bit on the translation that says, in the same way. It's not, it's not necessarily a bad translation, don't get me wrong, it's not a wrong translation, but you might be a little bit misled if you read into it an emphasis that is not there in the text. He is not saying in the same exact way. Because remember, just a few verses earlier, he had just told slaves to submit to their masters. So he says, slaves, submit to your masters. And then he says, wives, in the, likewise, or in the same way, submit to your husbands. And you might say, well, wait a minute. Is he equating uh, slaves to masters with wives to husbands? No, he is not equating the two. There is some real differences there, okay? But he is saying there are some similarities. There are some similarities in authority structure, when everything is working right and proper and good, there, are, there is some similarities, but it's not the same exact way. And so I would have translated it in a similar way. And so we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. And so with that in the background, it's interesting now that in verse 7, when he turns his attention to husbands, he, does, he also uses the same word. And husbands, in a similar way, live with your wives in an understanding manner. Now notice he does not say submit, however, he does say likewise. And so there is a sense that he is saying, husbands, submit to your wives. Now some of y'all have some red flags going right now when I said, just said that, right? Because nowhere in the text does it say husbands are to submit to their wives. And there's good reason for that. Because he's talking about authority and hierarchy. And headship. And so husbands are not to submit to the authority of their wives. Wives are submit to submit to the authority of their husbands. Husbands are not to submit to the headship of their wives. Wives are to submit to the headship of their husbands. But if we wanted to, we could take the time to turn to it. And I'm not going to take the time to turn to it. I'll give it to you for homework. You can look up Ephesians chapter 5. And read the whole chapter, Ephesians chapter 5. Not right now, you won't be able to listen to what I'm saying. But uh, later, go back and read Ephesians chapter 5 in its full context. Paul, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit that inspired the Apostle Peter to write this, he says, submit to one another. Submit to one another. And so there is, in a healthy, godly Christian ma marriage, a mutual submission. Now, it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. The wife is to submit to the headship of her husband. And the husband is to submit to the needs of his wife. He's not to be selfish and focused only on himself. Not demanding. And so I think Peter is wanting to sort of hedge a little bit and make sure that you don't misunderstand all that strong language that he was saying about complementarianism that we uh, have been hammering the last couple of weeks about the, the biblical uh, hierarchy within the home that the world these days hates. But it's biblical and it's right and it's Christ honoring and glorifying if we rightly understand it. And so like with most things, it's very easy to fall in the ditch on one side of the road or the other. And we want to make sure that we keep it straight and only say what God says. Because we know when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And so here he turns his attention to the husbands. And there's a reason why I believe that, because it goes in. I said already one reason was to make sure that the husbands didn't get the wrong idea and become dictators in their homes. Another is, is because in order for, listen to me carefully, in order for the wife to fulfill her responsibility in the home, it takes a husband who understands it. And a husband that meets his responsibilities. So let's look at that word husband here for a second to make sure you understand what I mean. Just the English word husband. We don't need to go to the Greek or to the Latin or anything else, even though it says basically the same thing. Even the English word husband is an interesting 
Word study. There's a discipline called husbandry. You ever heard of husbandry? It's really just another word for agriculture. And so you have animal husbandry, uh, crop husbandry. And so the word husband or husbandry literally just means to tend to something, to take care of something so that it flourishes and grows. And so you think of a farmer, for example, who is involved in agriculture or husbandry, or, or a gardener. Let's just take it on a smaller scale. A gardener. What does a gardener do? He takes a piece of land, he tills it up and prepares it, he plants a seed, and as that seed grows, he doesn't cause it to grow, but he better take care of it. He's going to nurture it. He's going to water it. He's going to irrigate it. He's going to fertilize it. He's going to protect it. He's going to take the weeds out. He's going to do some pest control. There's, some, there's a lot of things that need to happen in order for that plant to grow and to, to, to advance and to flourish and to bloom and to blossom and to produce, right? A few years ago, I really got into... I almost said got into gardening. I've dabbled in gardening. I've, I've watched a lot more YouTube videos than I've actually done gardening, okay? Uh, and read books about gardening and YouTube videos about gardening and done a little bit of gardening. Uh, but uh, watching the YouTube videos, I was pretty interested for a while, a few years ago, on market gardening. And what that is is on a small scale gardening or farming that they might only have like a half an acre or one acre and they only have a few clients. Their few clients are some certain restaurants, and they might focus on one or two things, you know, just maybe like lettuce or, or tomatoes or something like that. And, and it's very interesting how the care that they would put into growing these crops, these specialty crops, these high-end crops that they were able to produce. For example, tomatoes. You know, this one guy, he had this little setup. He only had like a half an acre, and he made a full living, provided for his whole family on a half an acre of land, growing nothing but high-end tomatoes. And I mean, he would get the best soil and the best fertilizers and an irrigation system. He even had a uh, little shade cloths that he would put up and down so that, the, so that the tomato plants would just get just the right amount of sun. And so early in the spring, he would keep the shade cloths off. And later in the summer, he would put the shade cloths up. And in some parts of the year, he would give them a few hours a shade of sunlight in the morning and then the afternoon he would hoist these shade cloths back up and he would take very good care of these tomato plants so that they would produce and thrive so that they would grow and bloom and flourish that's husbandry and it's interesting even in our english language that it's come to speak of a man his relationship with his covenant partner his wife. And it's a very biblical picture there of a husband who tends to his wife's needs to fertilize her, to, to water her, to care for her, to guard her, to protect her, to protect her from the hot sun, to protect her from the rabbits coming in or the deer coming in, or protect her from those types of things and to flirt, help her to flourish and be all that God would have her to be. And so that's one of the reasons why I said last week while we were looking at 12 characteristics of a godly wife that it's very important for the husbands to pay attention. Because all of those characteristics and qualities that ought to be in a wife are in part your responsibility as well. You see that guy growing those tomatoes wasn't out there yelling at the tomatoes, why don't you grow? He wasn't slapping the tomatoes around, why don't you grow? No, he was encouraging them with giving them what they needed to flourish. You, you see the analogy that's being made there? Even with the word husband, as we have here in the text. And so the Apostle Peter, wisely, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Likewise, husbands, I have a couple of things that I need for you to do. This is a command. This isn't just advice. This is a command from God. There's two aspects of that. And there'll be a few subpoints under it. But the first one he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. Dwell with your wives. Live with your wives in an understanding way. 
Now let me kind of read between the lines here and make sure and, and have it in context. There might be an aspect here that Peter is getting at that I didn't really see very many other commentators or, or people uh, pointing out. But ta- I, I believe context is very important. You got to understand the context. And since Peter has already been talking to wives, specifically with unbelieving husbands, it's very likely that he also has, at least in the back of his mind, husbands with unbelieving wives, you see. And these couples who are coming into Christianity, especially in the early church, knowing what the Apostle Paul says about marriage, that we are not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Paul deals with this a great deal in the letter to the Corinthians, that believers should be married to believers. That's very important, especially for young people looking for a spouse. If you are a believer, you need to find a godly Christian woman. And and every one of those are, are important. A godly Christian and nowadays you have to emphasize woman, right? <laughs> so a godly Christian woman is who you ought to be looking for as a spouse, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So knowing that in the background, what happens when you're an unbeliever and you're married already to an unbeliever and then you come to Christ, God gloriously saves you, you hear the gospel, you repent of your sins, you come to Christ, you get baptized, you join the church, and your wife is still an unbeliever. You say, we're not supposed to be unequally yoked together. What are we supposed to do? They're trying to figure this out in the early church. Do we now get a divorce? Do I go look for somebody else, just leave her behind and go find somebody else that we can do life together as believers? Paul says and elsewhere, no, that is not what you do. And that's, I think, what Peter is in part saying here as well. Men, even if you have an ungodly wife, a wife who is not a follower to Christ, what are you to do in this difficult situation? Continue to live with her. Continue to to live with her as your spouse. And I don't want to get too graphic. Whenever we talk about this kind of stuff, it always makes me a little nervous because there's something interesting here in the text that the ESV sort of clouds a little bit, but the King James uses the word knowledge there. And I think there's a little uh, euphemism that's there that's a very popular euphemism in the Bible about marital knowledge of each other. I'll just say, for example, we see in Genesis, Adam knew his wife and she bore a son. You know what I mean? They they knew each other. They didn't just swap phone numbers, if you know what I mean. Uh, So there's something going on there. And so Peter is saying here is, is, look, look, live with your wife. Live with your wife. Do what married couples do. Enjoy life together. That is God's good and gracious design for marriage. He says, live with your wife, with knowledge, with understanding. Now this understanding, uh, what are we supposed to understand? What are we supposed to know? I think a couple of things. Here's the sub-points under the statement that, where he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. What does it mean to live with her in an understanding way, in a knowledgeable way? I think there are two things that are going on there. One, in the knowledge of the Scriptures, in a knowledge of how marriage is supposed to work, understanding God's good design in marriage. You see, the world says a lot about marriage these days. And it is degraded, and it is distorted. The definition of marriage that is being used even by the United States government today has almost nothing to do with the biblical definition of marriage. We might even talk about same-sex marriage I ever told you, I, I'm, a, I, I, I'm a horrible speller. And, and so when I'm typing uh, on my word processor, uh, there's these little red squiggly lines under almost every other word. And uh, I spell so badly that when I type in the word marriage, the word processor don't even know what I'm trying to say. Uh, and it, it'll give you little suggestions. And a lot of times, instead of marriage, it'll say mirage. Did you mean mirage? I'm like... Same-sex mirage, yeah, that's probably that's a little bit closer. A mirage is something that appears, uh, but it's not really real. And a same-sex so-called marriage is not marriage. It's not how God intended it to be. It is a distortion. It is a falling short. And so marriage is a beautiful and a wonderful thing between a man and a woman. 
and for us to foster our marriages. We need to understand all that God says about marriage, about male headship in the home, about mutual submission, and all the rest. And so I think that's what Peter, part of what Peter is talking about here when he says, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, in a knowledgeable way, with your eyes wide open kind of way, with your eyes open and your Bible open, understanding God's good design for marriage. I also think that Peter is also here talking about understanding of not only understanding God's design for marriage, but understanding that woman that God has given you. That human being created in the image of God. Understanding how she thinks. Understanding what her passions are. Understanding her strengths. Understanding her weaknesses. How else are we to husband her correctly? How else are we going to foster her and, and help her to, produ- to produce and to, to flourish in the way that God has designed her to flourish? We need to get to know her very well to be sensitive to her needs. Just like that guy with the tomatoes, he would look at those tomatoes every day and check them out and look at how the leaves were developing and see if they were short on uh, calcium or, or, or having too much water or too little water or there was a tension. You can't just grow tomatoes like Brother Don tries to grow tomatoes. Me and Courtney have tried to grow tomatoes a few times. It's never really worked. Because we kind of put the seeds in the ground and come back several weeks later and we have dead tomato plants is all we got. Uh, a few times we've, we've fortunately had a few little tomatoes, but it takes work and we hadn't put that work in and so it didn't happen. And your marriage will shrivel up if attention is not given there. Now I'm, I, I know that there's so many things that we could say about this admonition for husbands to understand their wives. I can almost hear some of you saying, that's easier said than done, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You, you, you did hear the story. Oh, I, I, I don't know if I ought to tell this story or not. I debated this morning. I'll go ahead and, and tell you th- this story. You heard about the guy who uh, came down. He was from up north or something. He came down here to the Gulf Coast because he loved the the, the ocean, he loved the beach, he loved the sand, he loved the, the, the sun, and so he came down and he, and he really wanted to go to, to Jamaica, but he hated to fly. You know, so he said, he said, so he only made it down to the Gulf Coast. You know, he, so that's as close as he could get. And so he, he kind of took up residence here and had a little camper at Buccaneer State Park, and he's down there and he'd walk down the beach every day kind of wishing he was in Jamaica, but it was close enough, right? We're in the Neck Riviera here. And so he's, he's walking down the beach one day, and he comes across a bottle, Greg, and he opens the bottle, and a genie jumps out, <laughs> right? And so this genie jumps out, and, and the genie's kind of old and gray-headed and kind of decrepit and everything, but it's a genie nonetheless. And so he's like, he's all excited, and, and the genie looks at says, well, I guess you know the routine, right? He says, yeah, I get three wishes, don't I? And, and the genie says, no, hold on. Look, I'm an old genie. <laughs> I, 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 I've kind of had my, seen my better days. I'm kind of getting a little rusty around the edges, if you know what I mean. I, I, I'll try out one wish. How about that? And so the guy says, okay, one wish. I've always wanted to go to Jamaica, but I hate to fly. Could you build me a bridge from here, from Lakeshore to down to Jamaica? And I could just ride my motorcycle down to Jamaica, just a bridge right down there. And the genie looked at him and says, man, you've got to lost your mind. A, a bri- you know how, how big a bridge, a long a bridge would have to be from here to Jamaica? I can't do anything like that. You, know, you need to ask for something a little bit more reasonable, a little, something a little bit easier to do, if you know what I mean. He says, okay, well, me and my wife have been having a hard time. I just can't seem to understand her. Could you help me understand my wife? The genie looked at him and said, do you want that bridge to lanes or four? <laughs> so, which one is the easiest one here? I, I don't know if I could help with that. that. That's why I don't tell jokes in the pulpit too often. But, uh, but in, in all seriousness, I know the pushback. I know the pushback. That's easier said than done, Peter. Live with your wife with understanding. I don't understand my wife. Well, here's the reason why I kind of made light of that. Because I want I wanted to make a very serious point. We're never going to fully understand our spouse. Okay? We're not. But that doesn't mean that we get frustrated and give up. 
It's actually, there's a positive aspect to the fact that we do not really understand our wife all that well. You want me to give it to you? I was going to say it later on in, in the sermon in a few minutes, but I'll go ahead and put it here. I heard a, a preacher one time made, I thought it was an excellent point. This was a long time ago, years and years ago. I wasn't even married yet. And it was a group of a bunch of young pastors or the ministerial students, guys, pastors in training. And this one pastor was giving advice and telling some stories, and, and he was helping us out with some things. And he, and he started talking about marriage. And he said, some of you guys are having a hard time in your marriage, and I'll tell you why. He said, most problems in your marriage stem from the fact that you are mental homosexuals. Well, you can imagine us young guys were like, what? What, what is it? Hey, no, we're not. No, no, we're not. I mean, you know, we're scooching away from the guy sitting next to us and like sitting up straight. No. And he's like, no, he says, like, no, no. He says, hold on a minute. He says, I'm not, talk, I, I'm not saying physically. I said mentally. You know what the word homo means, right? It means the same. Hetero means different. A heterosexual is a man and a woman. Homosexual is two people of the same sex. He says, your problem is you want your wife to think mentally, we're talking about mental, to think just like you do. She doesn't. She's a woman. You're a man. Men and women think differently. And so you get upset because your wife thinks differently than you. You're a mental homosexual. You, you see his point? And see, God made us different. And that difference he made us by design so that we can complement one another, so we can fit together like two pieces of a puzzle and make it complete. That's actually the, the word usage that the Bible uses in the beginning when God created Eve for Adam as a help meet. The English word help meet, that's what English, King James says. I forgot what other translations use the word there. But it literally means a completer, one who completes. And so you, as a husband, see things in a certain way. And your wife sees things in a slightly different way so that she can see what you can't see and you can see what she can't see and so that together you make up a whole and are complete. You see? And so what Peter is saying here is, look, I, under, I know you're not going to understand your wife completely. Y'all can, can live together 50, 60, 70 years and you're never going to understand her completely. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. And see where she's coming from. And be on her team. To be her greatest cheerleader. To be her greatest supporter. To understand her for the glory of God. Do you see what he's saying? He says, so he says, number one, he says, live with your spouse, your wife, in an understanding way. He says, showing respect to her or to honor her, the woman who is the weaker vessel. And so the verb there in the second point is to honor her, to live with her with understanding and to honor her. And really, if, if I want to emphasize honoring her, I just repeat everything that I've just finished saying, because the, the way that you can honor her is to help her live the life that God has called her to live, to fulfill her role and duty in your family. As she raises and nurtures the children, the next generation, and she, as she ministers to you, making you as the husband all that you are to be for the glory of God. Mutually submitting to one another. With the husband as the head, as the leader, nurturing her in all that she does. As giving her honor. Recognizing, and here's where those two points kind of coalesce together, as the, notice what it says, oh, if this isn't a politically incorrect verse, as the weaker vessel. That's the language that Peter uses. The weaker vessel. A few things about that terminology, the weaker vessel. One is, I love that the Bible doesn't, make, it doesn't, doesn't try to apologize for the truth. It's just the reality. And the reality is, physically speaking, women are weaker than men, by and large. I know some women who are stronger than I am. I understand that. There, there's some exceptions to the rule. But by and large, and, and did, did some of you older people ever think that this would be a controversial statement? <laughs> I mean, that's how men made, God made us. 
And God made men and women with different bone structures, different molecular uh, muscle structures and all the rest. And by and large, men are physically stronger than women. We don't need to apologize for that. We don't need to, to, to make uh, excuses for that. That's a good and a glorious thing that God has done. It, it, but Peter is not being demeaning here when he's calling her the weaker vessel. He's not trying to put her down. He's, trying not, he's not trying to say something bad. It's actually good that she is the weaker vessel. There, there's, there's, I mean, I was thinking this morning, trying to figure out how I could explain this. Uh, <clears throat> certain, certain materials are softer than others, right? So cotton, for example, is soft, and sandpaper is hard. Which one is better, cotton or sandpaper? Well, it depends on what, you, what, you, what you're do, doing with it, right? When I put my socks on this morning, I was glad that cotton is not the same as sandpaper, right? <laughs> I mean, it, so it was, it was nice to put in cotton socks, not sandpaper socks. And so but being softer is not a bad thing. It depends on what your function is, what your role is, and what you're trying to do. And so Peter, and I say all that to make sure that we don't misunderstand what Peter is saying. He's not being demeaning at all. Um, he is just stating a fact of reality. And I think he is here speaking primarily of physically. Primarily physically. Uh, because we know that as we take the whole counsel of God, actually the next point that he's about to make, we are not talking spiritually weaker. We are not talking even emotionally weaker even though men and women do tend to have differing emotions. Uh, I, I've often said, and I'm not ashamed to say it, out of Courtney and I's relationship, I am the one that is more visibly emotional. I'm the passionate one. I'm the, I'm the one that gets stirred up easy. I'm the one that cries the easiest. I, I, I told Courtney this the other day. I, I'm going to go ahead and tell the whole church this. Can you believe I'm going to tell? I was embarrassed to tell my wife, and I'm going to tell the whole church now. Uh, I, I, was, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and the, the storyline in the, in the podcast is neither here nor there. was a news story. And the guy was talking about a couple who was going through in vitro fertilization, you know, and they had the, the, the test tube baby or whatever. And so the, the embryo was in the hospital, and he was telling the story about how the woman would go to the, drive home from, the, from her work every day, and she would take the long way home so that she could go and sit in the parking lot at the hospital and sing a lullaby to her baby who was in frozen state in the hospital. And something was touching with that with me. And I'm sitting there in my backyard with two hound dogs sitting there eating lunch with tears coming out my eyes because it was touching to me. I, I'm emotional, okay? Uh, and, and sue me. What are you going to do? Uh, and, and so, now, Courtney, it, it, she, she doesn't cry very easily. She doesn't cry very easily. And so we, we are not the stereotypical men and women. However, on the other, other hand... I very rarely make a decisions based upon emotions. And a woman is going to make decisions based on those emotions, and that's not necessarily bad either. She's going to see the emotional side. I'm going to see the analytical side, and we work together, you see. And so that's what Peter is talking about here. Is, look, she is the weaker vessel. She is the tomato plant that needs nurturing, that needs shade, needs protection from the deer coming in and eating it. There's a protecting role that men are to have. Men are to be, husbands are to be protectors and providers. Now we're co-laborers with our spouse, and we talked a little bit about women working outside the home week, last week or week before. And all of those things are within the boundaries of what God has designed. But what Peter is wanting us to do is to take into consideration the reality of God's good design. Do you see? And so when he says here that she is the weaker vessel, I think he's talking specifically about the spiritual, I mean the uh, physical differences between men and women. But then he very quickly goes to the spiritual. So you got my outline, our outline, we're saying number one, live with your wife with understanding. And here's some things where we need to understand, that you're to honor her. And then here's two things. The reason why you're to understand her and honor her is because she is the weaker vessel, and, and, and by God's design, you're to protect her and to provide for her. But spiritually speaking, we're on equal footing. It, say, it says that she is, uh, how, how does it say it? Uh, since they are, women, are 
heirs with you of the grace of life. They're heirs with you of the grace of life. Now here I think that he's talking about both salvific grace and common grace. Some have argued uh, in, in some of the stuff that I was reading this week, is Peter talking about salvific grace, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Salvific grace or common grace? I, I think he's talking about both. I, think there's a, I don't think you have to make a distinction here. Salvific grace or saving grace, you know what that is. When you come to understand the gospel, when you hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Where the Apostle Paul in Ephesians says, you are saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you hear the good news of the gospel, that God saves sinners, that Jesus Christ came to earth, died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin for all those who would repent of their sins and trust in Him. And that salvation is by grace alone. What Peter is saying here is, for me to put it on the bottom shelf and y'all are all going to say, duh, women can be saved too. <laughs> now I know that might sound like I'm being a little um, uh, elementary there. But remember, this is at the beginnings of the dawn of the new covenant. Under the old covenant, in the Old Testament, in the old covenant, it, was, it mattered whether you were a Jew or a Greek. It mattered whether you were a slave or free. And it mattered whether you were a man or a woman. That's why the Apostle Paul in Galatians says that now we're in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We're all one in Christ. That does not mean those distinctions don't exist any longer. He's not saying that we need to abandon our ethnicity He's not saying that we abandon our gender. He's not saying that we abandon our station in life. But what he does say is the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You see, under the old covenant, not to get too graphic, but men were circum boys were circumcised, women, uh, girls weren't. But under the new covenant, when you come to Christ, everybody's baptized. Everybody's under the new covenant, you see. All will know the Lord, as Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 says. And so Peter is here reminding them, look, if, as we think through what it means to have a rightly ordered family with the husband as the head of the home, don't take it so far to make it mean something that we don't really mean. A man doesn't have any spiritual advantage over a woman, even though there's certain things within the home that it's the man man's responsibility to do, just like within the church, and also, I would say, physically speaking, especially in society, those things need to make sure that we see that there's a difference. When we come to accessing the throne of grace, men and women are on equal footing. Oftentimes, and I've said this before, I know my wife is a much better Christian than I am, and so Peter reminds husbands of that. But also, I think he's also talking about common grace. That's salvific grace, saving grace. I think he's also talking about common grace. You know what common grace is? Common grace is the recognition that everything we have is a grace gift from God. And, and that common grace extends not only to believers, but also even to unbelievers. Jesus said it this way, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And so you, you don't have to be a Christian to enjoy hot boiled crawfish, right? You don't have to be a Christian to enjoy a sunset. You don't have to be a Christian to enjoy the good things of this life. Now, being a Christian helps you to appreciate them more and give God glory for them. But common grace is the grace that God has infused into the universe for the good of His creation. And so if we understand that as the grace of life, what Peter is saying here is, you as husbands and wives, live together enjoying the good things that God has to offer. The grace of life. Live the real good life. The world has its definition of the good life. God's life is so much, God's good life is so much better. 
God's good life is so much better. I need to hurry and finish up. He says all of those things. And then he says, here's the purpose. Here's why, husbands, I want you to live with understanding of your spouse. Here's why that you're to honor the weaker vessel. Here's why that you're to recognize that you are co-heirs with the grace of life. He says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Does, it, does that strike any of you as interesting as it does to me? I would have expected... Now, I, I kind of read ahead. I knew it was coming. But I would have, if I would have been reading this for the first time, I would have expected him to say, do all those things so that you can have a happy marriage. Right? That, 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 that's what he, you think that he would have said. So that you can have a happy home. You know, happy wife, happy life, right? Is that how it goes? And so, and so you would think that he would say that. I believe that is true. But Peter's saying, look, we're talking about something much more serious than just having a good day. I'm talking about something much more meaningful than just getting along with the person that you're living with. This impacts your relationship with God. You see, sometimes people try to make this distinction, a dichotomy between just the physical, mundane, day-to-day -day life that we have, these relationships that we have, and all the rest, and then the theological thing that is our relationship with God. The Bible doesn't make a, a distinction there. He says they are interconnected so much that you cannot unravel them. He says if you don't have your home life right, husbands, your prayers are going to be hindered. Your relationship with God is going to be hindered. This is, this is the relationship between not just a husband and a wife, but between a man and his God. And Peter speaks of those two things in the same breath. Now, oh, there's so much that, that I could say there about hindered prayer. The Bible says a great deal about that. We'll have to say that all for an, another day. Uh, I'm not going to pick up on that, but there's, there's so much there of the Bible talks about how your prayers are hindered. And I think there's, there's one link that I want you to see that I think is very interesting. You don't have to turn to it, but over in the book of James. In James, I think it's James chapter 4. I have to look it up again. But James chapter 4, James is talking about our prayer life, and he's talking about unanswered prayers. And, and, he, and he gives some of the reasons for unanswered prayers. We can go elsewhere and see some other places they talk, that the Bible talks about unanswered prayers. But one, he says, he says, you, you, you do not have because you have not asked. Or you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. And so in other words, you, you don't have because you hadn't even prayed about it. And so that's one reason your prayers aren't answered because you ain't even praying. So there, there's, there's one thing. But then he goes a little bit deeper. He says, but when you do pray and your prayers aren't answered, one of the reasons is because you pray to spend it on your own lusts, the King James says. You, you, you pray and you, you, you pray so that you can spend it on your own passions. In other words, your, your prayers are not answered because you have selfish prayers. God doesn't answer selfish prayers. God answers prayers that go along with the thinking, but find what Jesus told, told us to pray. Pray that His will be done. Not our will, but His kingdom come, not our kingdom. And so selfish prayers are not answered. That's what James says. And I think Peter's kind of getting at the same thing here. He's saying, look, husbands, if you have a marriage that's one-sided, that you're expecting her to give her 50% before you'll meet her halfway, you're just spinning your wheels. And your prayers are not going to be answered. You're entering this marriage relationship in a selfish way. If your wife is nothing more than a hunk of flesh to fulfill your physical passions, your prayers will not even be answered. But if you understand that you are there to nurture her, to submit to her needs, to cause her to flourish, then your household will be filled with flowers and not weeds. As you commit yourself to her, and she commits herself to you, God is glorified, 
And that's the kind of marriage that God loves to bless and answer prayers out of. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you and praise you, Lord, for the gift of marriage. And as we have thought about these things today, I pray not only for the marriage relationships that we have here in our church, but Lord, even for those whose marital life is behind them and have memories, some of them difficult memories. Lord, I pray that you would comfort those men and women here today and that we would learn from their experience and that they would be willing to share it as we pray for them and they pray for us. We pray as well for those young people who are looking forward to the day of marriage and a life together that you would bless them and that Lakeshore Baptist Church would be a seedbed for those kinds of healthy, good relationships to flourish and to grow and to blossom for your glory. And for those of us in the thick of things, we pray that our marriages might be in tune with your perfect design. We pray that you would forgive us for our failings and our shortcomings, and we thank you for that grace of life. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing a hymn of response. Mr. Larry.